Uh, yeah, so as you already said, the title is Conditional Hardness for the Frechet Distance Under Translation. And I'm Andre, and this is joint work with Carl, who you already saw today in the morning, and Marvin, who you will see in the next session. And this was published at SODA 19, but I will just present one part of the, of the SODA paper here. So in one sentence, even though you already said, uh, kind of said this now, I'm using fine-grained complexity theory, or fine Brain complexity theory used in computational geometry showing a surprisingly high lower bound corresponding to the size of the arrangement of the problem. And uh, yeah, so I will go through this now slowly and, and explain you what the result is. So first, this is about curve similarity. So given two curves, you want to know how similar they are. And just to be clear, when I talk about curves, I mean polylines. So for this talk, I'm just restricting to polygonal chains. So on the left side here, you see two similar curves. Those might just come from two people walking alongside each other with GPS trackers. And on the right side, you see two curves which actually are not that similar. Uh, on first glance, you might think that they are similar, but actually the red curve does one round while the blue curve does two rounds. And we need some distance measure to capture this. And of course, this talks about the Frechet distance under translation, but the Frechet distance first is uh, a curve similarity measure that captures this, and I will give the intuition of what the Frechet distance is first. So we have a human and we have a dog, and they are connected by this leash here, and the human walks along this red trajectory, and the dog walks along this blue trajectory. And they start here in the first two nodes, and now there are three possible movements that they can do. So first, they can both jump to the next vertex, which happened here, or the human can jump to the next vertex, or the dog can jump to the next vertex. And like this, they traverse the whole trajectories until they end up in the last nodes. And now we want to know what is the, what are the, is the best such traversal which achieves the shortest leash length. And what do I mean by leash length? I mean the largest distance that they have during the traversal, and that's the leash length, okay? So that was the intuitive definition. Let me give a more formal definition. The Frechet distance of two curves pi and sigma is the minimum over those valid traversals. And what are we minimizing? We minimize the maximum distance that they have during this traversal. And this is the length that I talked about. OK? But in the title, it didn't say Frechet distance, but Frechet distance under translation. So what is this now? Now, instead of, um, instead of just computing, or instead of just wanting to know the Frechet distance, we actually can translate one curve here by, by tau. And we are in the plane, by the way. Uh, so we can translate one curve by tau. And now we want to find the best translation such that the Frechet distance of the first curve and the second translated curve is minimized. And that's the Frechet distance under translation. So now if we look at two curves, then here on the left, we can see two quite similar curves. And on the right, two not so similar curves. Why is that? Because we can just translate the first curve up but the similar curves and for the second curves, there's not really a, an alignment between those two. Good. So there's a lot of related work. Um, here for the continuous Frechet distance under translation, there was an n to the 8 algorithm for n being the curve length because we have polygonal chains. It's just the number of nodes of the curve. And for the discrete Frechet distance under translation, we have n to the 6 and n to the 5. So it got improved to n to the 5. And uh, all those algorithms actually build the arrangement of the problem. So kind of they partition the plane into, into parts where all the translation in those parts are equivalent. And this arrangement size is actually n to the 4, which will match our lower bound. And yeah, this is what uh, he said before, uh, that kind of those algorithms kind of intuitively do the right thing somewhat. And there's also a conditional lower bound by, by Carl, which is quadratic and which also carries over. Yeah. OK. Now, the two results that we had in, in this paper. First, we have uh, this theorem, which says the discrete Frechet distance under translation of curves of length n in the plane requires time n to the 4 minus the lower of 1 unless the strong exponential time hypothesis fails. So we have an n to the 4 lower bound. And in the same work, we actually showed that there is an algorithm which runs in time O tilde n to the 4.666. So there is still a little bit of a gap left, 
and this still uh, remains to be closed. And this was improved from the end to the five algorithm that I just mentioned. And I will focus on the lower bound because we are in a fine grained complexity workshop. Good. So, the, as I already mentioned, the Frechet distance has, an, has a quadratic lower bound. Via, so I didn't say it's via orthogonal vectors, but it, well, the original paper, I think, was from strong exponential time hypothesis, but you can also do it from, from orthogonal vectors or from satisfiability it was, but you can also do it from orthogonal vectors. And the question is, can we, can we extend this somehow? And a reduction from 4 OV would actually give the desired lower bound. So I'm not sure if everyone here knows what 4 OV is, so I will define it. 4 OV is the following problem. Now, instead of two sets of vectors, like in OV, we have given four sets of vectors, which are binary and in D dimensions, and each set has size n. And what we want is we want four vectors such that for all dimensions, there exists one of those vectors which has a zero entry. Okay, so this is kind of an extended definition of orthogonality. And the naive runtime is simply trying everything out. So n to the four times d. This is a naive runtime, and then the four of the hypothesis is that there is no n to the four minus epsilon times poly d algorithm. And note that actually the strong exponential time hypothesis implies the four of the hypothesis. So then we also have a reduction from Seth. Good. Now, let me go through the high-level ideas of, of the reduction. So I will first show the high-level ideas, then I will show the rough reduction, and then I will show you the, like, a bit more details of the gadgets that we used, such that kind of in steps you can, you can understand maybe the, what the core ideas were of the reduction. So first, we... I mean, we do a reduction from 4 OV to the discrete Frechet distance under translation. And so we need to somehow use the curves to choose the vectors. And we have four vectors to choose. And how we choose our vectors is via the translational dimension. So depending on how we translate the second curve, a specific four vectors are chosen. So for each, for, uh, each translational dimension, we uh, we thus have two vectors that we should choose. So we get something here where we have a grid which is of size n squared times n squared. So n is the size of the, uh, the number of vectors in each set. And one cell here corresponds to a choice of those four vectors. So this is kind of how we, how we choose the vectors. And this is a picture in translational space. So in tau, tau 1, tau 2 as axis. And now, if we kind of chose vectors, so intuitively, we want to check how, I mean, we want to check orthogonality of those vectors. And um, r roughly how we do this is for the first curve, we check for zeros in V1 and V3, in first and third vector. And the second curve checks for zeros in V2 and V4. And how they do this is here, they, so the first curve checks for zeros in V1 in, via the X translation, and uh, for in V3 for via the Y translation. And this is intuitively why we get an N to the four lower bound. We have two curves, and we have two translational dimensions. And this is why, in the end, we end up with N to the four, intuitively. And then also we have to encode a logical OR, because, I mean, the curves are sequential, so we have to skip certain parts of the, of the curves and to, to kind of then arrive at the right gadgets to traverse. And for this, we need an OR gadgets. And basically, what we do is just we kind of we choose parts of the curve. On one curve, we walk forward. While we stand, stay in with the other curve, we just stay in a certain point, And then we just walk forward on the other curve until we then tra can traverse our gadget. And this is, this is uh, inspired by the previous conditional lower bound on the Frechet distance. Yeah. No, I, we are translating. Oh, we translate both of the curves. I mean, that's crucial. That's crucial that we trans. I mean, just for the OR gadget, basically, what we do is we first walk forward on one curve, 
and then we stay in a certain point, and then we walk forward on the other curve, stay in a certain point, and then we, um, yeah, and then we traverse our gadgets. I. Yes. Yeah, we're translating only one curve. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I, I will go through the rest now. So maybe maybe it gets clearer. Otherwise, we can talk afterwards. So this is how the whole uh, reduction looks like. Might look a bit, little bit complicated, but it's yeah. Okay, it is sometimes somewhat. But um, there are actually just four gadgets that we need. So first, we need a translational gadget. And this just limits the, the possible translations. And this is re really, this is the whole gadget that you can see here. It just says that we cannot translate this, the blue curve too much up, down, left, or right. And so I won't go into detail here. This is just to, to make, also to simplify things. Then we have an OV dimension gadget, where this is basically just here we check if there's a zero in the first dimension of the four vectors, if there's a zero in the second dimension, and so on and so forth, until the last dimension. So this is also all that I'm going to show about this gadget. But then there's this OR gadget that I already mentioned, and then there's an equality gadget. So the OR gadget is uh, what I said, that basically we have to uh, kind of select the right vectors for which we have to select kind of the, the right parts of the curve to check for the zero entries. And I will show in the next slide a bit more about this, um, about this OR gadget. And also the equality gadget, because here, um, I mean, those are somewhat independent, but we still have to make sure that we don't cheat. I mean, we always, the translation kind of fixes the four vectors that we choose, and we have to make sure that we are consistent over those different dimensions. And this is what the equality gadget does. Okay, so let me now explain those uh, two gadgets. I mean, I just give a high level overview. There's a lot of things missing, but the, the main idea for the equality gadget, so we want, to make, we want to have two parts of a curve. So those are parts then later of this blue part is of sigma, and this red part here is of pi. And we want to make sure that we restrict the translation in the first dimension, and also we restrict the, part, uh, the translation in the second dimension like in the sense that we can only traverse those two curves if we have this specific translation. So here, uh, we have those two parts. So we start in those two nodes here, and then we want to end up in those two nodes. And those here are quite far. So the only way how we can traverse those is that we jump uh, simultaneously from those nodes to those nodes. OK? And what this gives us is that here, actually, we can move this node here. So if we move the whole curve, we can move this node here to the right. It just gets closer to this red node here. And uh, this is fine. But we cannot really move it to the left if we choose the right, the right distance and the right uh, threshold. And therefore, we get a lower bound on our translation in the first dimension. And this depends on v1 and v2, because the curves depend on v1 and v2. And now if we jump to the, to the top nodes here, then actually now we can uh, move the curve to the left, I mean from the perspective of this node here, but we cannot really move it to the right. So actually we get an upper bound on the first translational dimension. And yeah, so what we end up is with is that the translation is roughly uh, this function of v1 and v2, and this is how we can actually realize this, this grid that I showed you before. And the same we can also do for v3 and v4 and, and the second translational dimension. And we basically here we just traverse from this side to this side, and then we have uh, kind of the same, the same thing. The important thing is that here it's, so red is here on this diagonal and also in this diag diagonal, and for blue it's the same thing. And this is important later for our OR gadget, which I now will say, and then uh, we're done. So here, this now corresponds to this. And in the OR gadget, basically, uh, so what we do with those gadgets, we just insert them if, the, if there's a zero entry, such that we can only traverse any of those gadgets if there was a zero entry, basically. And now we want to choose the right vector, and how we do this is 
So first we stay here in the first curve, and in the second curve we just traverse this, and we have a distance uh, which is small enough. And then we uh, stay here in the red curve, and we just traverse this blue part here until we are at the right, at the right uh, part of the gadget that we want to choose. So now basically we are here on the first node here and the first node here, and now we tra traverse this equality gadget for which actually we have a zero entry and where we are in the right uh, translation. And then we just go to the end of the curves. And this is kind of how we, how we choose the right parts of the curve. Okay, so I hope that was not too uh, fast and confusing. So let me wrap up. Um, we have a lower bound that comes from OV and uh, yeah, I'm not sure how many lower bounds there are actually that come just from for V, which not are from a series of, of lower bounds. Um, so that, that would be interesting. If you know a lower bound which just comes from for V and without like coming from a series of KOV, uh, you can tell me. Um, it matches the size of the arrangement, what I saw, said before. We have this n to the four arrangement and actually this exactly matches our lower bound. So. Uh, that kind of hints at that this arrangement is indeed necessary to construct, which all of those algorithms did. And we have four choices encoded in two dimensions and two curves. Um, yes, we can talk if you, if you didn't understand it yet. Uh, I can explain you later. And there are open problems. Um, so conditional lower bounds for other curve similarity measures because I work quite a lot on geometry, so this is interesting for me. And also uh, more lower bounds that actually match the size of the arrangement. And good, thank you. Before we stop, this doesn't look as beautiful as it looks on my screen. This is the map of Tel Aviv with uh, all the GPS trajectories of OpenStreetMap. So it's quite fun to work on trajectories. There's a lot of data and you can play around. You have beautiful pictures if the resolution is good. Thanks.